Hey, uh, thank you for allowing me to come. I, I realize that most of you probably have no idea who I am. I, I really like that. I like to live a little incognito, not because I'm ashamed of my life or anything, but I don't care for public kind of like all the attention and stuff. I'd rather just come and preach, and I hope today as I preach that you won't remember who I am or, or all that kind of stuff. You'll just realize that's a guy that loves the Lord just like me, and I hope the Lord uses it to speak to you. Now, uh, I, I do need to tell you that I live right across the lake. I live in Holland, Michigan, and literally almost dead across the lake. At night, I have a buddy who um, has a house out on the beach in, in a Holland area. And at night, I've gone over there. And it, on a perfect night, when the winds are just right and the ozone's perfect or whatever, I don't know. But when cars turn in the streets in Milwaukee, you literally see the lights all the way across the lake. I know it sounds crazy, but you really, you really can't. I saw it with my friend. It's crazy. You can. So we're neighbors, whether you know it or not. We're, we're neighbors. I'm just right across the lake. And so I hope as I share with you today, you'll go, that's just a neighbor who came over from across the lake to talk to us. Uh, I'm throwing up a little picture of my family, and I'm doing that on purpose. Uh, we had this guy speak at our church over in the Holland area. And uh, about two years after he spoke, we found out that he had made up all those stories about his family. He had never been married, and it was all like a con game. Well, I want you to know, that really is the real deal. That really is my family. They're alive, and they are around this nation in different places. My son on the far right is a traveling speaker just like me. He works for our organization, Winning at Home. He's speaking today, actually, in a prison and uh, sharing the Lord's love there. My uh, wife, Jane, of 30 years, uh, a little daughter who got married, 21. This is Christina in the middle. We got married, uh, she got married in our backyard this summer uh, to Jonathan. And then next to her is my daughter, Anna. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about her today. She is 18. Maybe that's a good way to say it. She is 18 this coming week. Uh, there's a word that rhymes with 18 called frightening. And so that's kind of <laughs> her. Then my son Josh is 23, the one on the left there. He uh, is planting a church in Camden, New Jersey. And next to him is his girlfriend, Amy. Uh, they'll be getting married. She's from Peoria, Illinois, and they'll be getting married in August. And so that's my family. Now, now my, in that picture, I, if I'm you looking at it, I, I realize it's my family. But it looks, uh, doesn't it? it looks, uh, key word, looks awesome. But I want you to know, it doesn't feel that way right now. We're dealing with some heavy family issues. My daughter that's 18 has, has chosen to make some choices. It's really been killing our family. So I'm not going to stand up here today and say to you, if you just do this and this and this and this, everything will be great. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to show you today how to try to hold on to your family even when the going gets tough. Because the last six months of my life have been my hardest so far. I wish it wasn't true. I'd like, I told the men yesterday, I'd love to come up here and say, things are rocking and rolling, got four kids all over the Lord, serving him, it's beautiful, but that's not where I'm at. And I hope as I share today, you can realize one big thing. I am a normal Walmart shopper just like you. Uh, I live in the real world. I love the Lord Jesus Christ, and my life is challenging. And what I want to do is just kind of use that as a segue, introducing you, introducing you to the idea of, of this little basket. I want you to imagine today that this little basket is your family. I've got real eggs, all kind of filled this thing up with real eggs in here. And I want you to imagine that this basket represents your life. Uh, if you're a grandparent here and you've got 17 eggs, great. You, both of you have to hold on to it. It's so heavy now. No problem. That's good. Uh, maybe you're here and you're going through a very difficult family situation. You've got a basket. You say, well, Dan, I'm single. I, I, I know sometimes when you say a guy's going to speak on family that you kind of go, oh, it's, it's not really for me. You, you, are you kidding me? You are a part of a family. You, you live in a family. It's, you came from a family. I, I don't know your scenario, but I want you to let it be represented by this basket. And I want to talk to you about what I see happening all across our world with this. I don't care what country I go to. I see the same thing. Same thing. And I'm going to talk about it from a dad's perspective because I'm a dad. I could say that I'm a woman and talk, but it wouldn't come off right. So I want to, I'm going to be a dad. You can apply it as a lady, however it fits. What I see happening around our nation is I, I see a lot of men. Some, I have friends doing this right now. They, they, are, they, are, they, they know that this is a gift from God. They know this basket is something. It's a treasure. It's something. These eggs that are in it are awesome. They love them. They're thankful for them. But they're just so busy I mean I care about you guys and man I'm so glad you're in my life and, and there'll be a day I'll spend time with you but right now it's got so much going on 
I had a lady come up to me after the last service and say, Dan, that's me. That was me. I, I, I got my career. I got to, if I could just give me two more years. And I can just tell you that your children are in that basket going, can I just have some time with you? My, my children today, um, I'd say Anna probably knows where I'm speaking. I, maybe, maybe my oldest son, but I doubt the others have any idea. Because all they want to know is that dad loves them. I don't impress them with where I speak or where I go or how far I travel. Oh, guess what, kids? I was on a big plane. I flew a thousand miles this week. And they're like, wow, wow, impressive, Dad. doesn't matter. They want, Do you love me, Dad? Did you text me this week, Dad, to tell me that I'm pretty special to you? Did, did you say, I, 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 my daughter there who got married, right after their marriage, they, they found out they're going to have a child. I'm going to be a grandpa. You know what she wants to know right now? You know what she sent me a picture of yesterday? They put the crib up in her room. And she's like, Dad, what do you think of the crib? I'm like, baby, that's going to be awesome. I can't wait to be a grandpa. That's what she, she didn't say. Dad, where are you? In, in Elmbrook? She just wants to know I love her and I'm thrilled about a little grandbaby coming. And I, I, I'm just going to tell you today, this basket is something given to you by God. Invest in it. Don't sit it down. I see a lot of men, and it can be both ways, but I see a lot of men who look in their basket and they look at that egg they married 20 years ago. And it's kind of, the shape is kind of flipped. <laughs> and, and they kind of go, I don't, I don't really, this isn't really what I want anymore. I, I'm a realist. I mean, we can sit up here and act like that doesn't happen, but it happens like crazy. And, and, and they kind of looked at that egg and said, I, you know, I, I'm not sure. I don't really want that egg anymore. And you just feel tossed out. My wife had that happen to her when she was six years old. She watched her dad toss the egg out. I watched my dad just sit the basket down. It's life. Many of you relate to the, many of you feel like you were tossed. I don't understand what I'm about to say other than the redeeming love of God. But God, God reaches down in this waste basket of people who feel tossed and torn. And like this, this trash can is actually full of a whole bunch of stuff. And you feel like you're just down in the middle of all that trash. And, and Satan tells you, you're no good. You're just a piece of trash. And I want to tell you, God, even though it's healed and hurt and sometimes even cracked, God picks this egg back up and says, no, no, no. Don't you believe the lie of Satan. You, are, you can be redeemed and you are in my life. I love you. I created you. I have a plan for you. Don't you dare believe in that old situation satanic basket i have a purpose and i'll put you back in a basket that's beautiful if you're here today and you feel like you were once tossed don't you dare don't you dare let satan beat you up with that i spoke to a group over um two two, uh, two thursdays ago my son and i spoke to a group of people who were divorced not by their choice not by their choice they all came and they're just sitting there and they're hurting and i talked to them about the healing la, the grace of god that picks you up and puts you into a basket and says, I love you. Don't you dare feel that you've been tossed out and you're no good. I'm, I'm ham- I didn't talk about this near this much in the last few services, but maybe somebody today, this is just on my heart to tell you, don't you believe Satan's lie. You are valuable to the kingdom of God and to your own family. You hang in there. And what I need to know and what I want you to know how to know is, how do I hold on to this basket? I mean, I want to be a good dad. You want to be a good parent. You want to be a good single parent. You want to be a good single individual in the basket that we hold family, influencing your nephews. You want to be a good grandma. It's just life. We want to do good with this basket. How do we do that? God's word in the book of Proverbs, if you'll turn to it, Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs, if you'd turn to it right now, the book of Proverbs, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 24. I said three, verses 3 and 4 of Proverbs 24. Proverbs chapter 24, verses 3 and 4. The Word of God says there, and and many of you probably have this little proverb somewhere around in your house. It says, By wisdom a house is built, and through understanding it is established. Through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. I have often thought as I've read that verse, you know... um, How how it just rolls off your tongue. If you have your devotions on a regular basis and sometimes you go through the Proverbs, you probably read right over it. By wisdom a house is built. It could be a, it could easily be a chorus. By wisdom a house is built. I mean, it's, it just flows. And sometimes when we read these things in scripture, we go, oh, that's cool. And we kind of pass right over it. 
But I want to kind of take a moment this morning and tell you what I believe this passage really teaches us for hanging on to our baskets. In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 19, the Word of God also talks about the fact that by wisdom, God put the supernatural universe in place. God did all that He did, putting the universe in place, the galaxies, everything. He did it through wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. The same principles He says of how you build a house. So if God says, I can hold this universe together with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, then I ought to take a peek at that. If he can make the universe work, I ought to be able to make my family work using the same principles. And the first thing it teaches us is that wisdom is what builds the house. Wisdom. Now I want to tell you today, there's a big difference between wisdom, hang in with me a second, wisdom and smartness. In our world, we have replaced a lot of wisdom. In fact, really wise people are almost mocked in the media these days. If you say something referencing God or saying that God taught you or or you believe from God's word this is true, you are called foolish. The message I'm preaching today, if it could be broadcast across the nation, there would be many that would say, oh, that's so foolish. I ask you at the end of this message to consider, is it wisdom I'm speaking or is it smartness? And don't get me wrong, I'm all about intelligence. Get as much education as you can. Those of you who are in school, study and learn. I've done it too. I have degrees in lots of different things, but I want to tell you, that's not what makes me wise. No one's ever said to me, you know what? You, you got a, you got a degree in that and that and that. You, I have a degree in accounting, believe it or not. You have a degree in accounting. Wow, you really must be wise. Nobody's ever said that to me because of my degrees. The people who have called me wise, the letter I've received that's saying, Dan, you're a really wise man, they watch how I try to love my family. They watch how I try to care for things that really are eternally important. If you're here today and you think that smartness is what you need to, to raise a family and have a basket, it's not. Intelligence won't do it. I can prove it. Uh, as Steve said, I get to speak at a lot of different places. One of the places I got to speak not long ago was uh, at a horticulture convention, believe it or not. I get called to speak at corporations quite often, and I absolutely love it. I am a preacher, but I love to get called into corporate setting. I spoke at a couple corporations last week. And you say, well, what do you talk about? I talk about how to balance doing all your work and then going home and caring for and loving your family. I I do that a lot, and I love to do it because I give them principles that work for work and for home. So this guy called me up, the president of this horticulture group. They were going to have about 2,000 people that was going to gather over at one of the universities in, the, in, in, in Michigan. I won't say the name of the university, but Green S. And so we were going over to, uh, to this university, and I was going to speak there. And they had brought in people from all across the nation. And actually some of them from around the world. And the dude said to me, Dan, I want you to speak at 11 o'clock. I got a 9 o'clock speaker, a 10 o'clock speaker, and you'll be 11 o'clock. It wasn't my favorite idea because usually by then people are tired. It's almost lunchtime. And I said, well, I'll, I'll do it. So I arrived at like 9.30 and um, showed up at the venue where I'd be speaking. And I walked in with the president and we kind of came down the aisle. And I sit on the third row. The, the first guy was up speaking, like I say, 9.30. He's in the middle of his speech. He finished his speech. He went down. And then the second speaker, I was going to be third. The second speaker came up and he came up on stage and he began to speak. And he was, I'll just, I'll just say from my perspective, the most intelligent speaker I've ever heard in my life. Especially on horticulture. I grew up, uh, and, and you may not see this, but I'm from the South. I grew up in South Carolina, a uh, little, little town called Six Mile, close to Clemson University. And my dad uh, works for Clemson University in the forestry department. He's, he's been involved in that for many, many years. And I, I know that trees have branches. I know they got roots. I know you got to give them water. I get it. I know what makes a tree grow. But this dude knew trees. He started talking, and I did not even know what he was saying. I recognized the in-between, the ands, the buts, the when, it. I got those words. But he he started off like, now, thank you, everyone. I'm here to talk about the uh, sporeohor tree. And it has the uh, barniferous roots, and it is going to be growing from the sporeohor varia. And I, I, I was just like, wow. And I leaned over the president, I go, oh my word, this guy is brilliant, isn't he? So Dan, he said, I don't want to burst your bubble, but people didn't come to hear you. (laughs) He said, this guy is world renowned. I mean, he is probably the foremost speaker on trees and he's incredible. And I was like, wow, that's all. I have no idea what he talked about for an hour, but it was good. 
I saw people taking notes. It was big. And he finished speaking. I was one of the first ones. Yo, 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 what's up? That was good, you know? I mean, I'm clapping for him. and I don't even know what he said, but I clapped for him. And so he comes walking off the stage. And what, I'm going to tell you what happened because you're not going to believe what I tell you. He came walking off the stage, and, he, and, and I got up with the president, because I'm next, right? So he, I come walking up, he's walking down, and as I pass him, I go, yo, yo, bro, that was unreal. You know, I'm giving him five, like, that, that's a good speech. I don't know what he said, but that was good. So I come walking up, the president's like, now we got Dan Seaborn from Winning at Home. He's going to talk to us about our families. And he walks off. And here I stand, knowing they just heard world-renowned dude, and he was awesome, and they loved it. So... I said to the audience, well, thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, I am not a tree expert. I did grow up with my father down in Clemson University, so I know a little bit. Of, I remember photosynthesis. That's my biggest word. <laughs> and I said, but I, but I will tell you that, that I, I said, I will tell you this. If you know everything about trees, but you go home and you don't know anything about your children, your life is not going to be complete. And I said, I want to spend the next hour telling you how to know your children and know your spouse like you know your work. And I hope you're willing to listen. And I began to talk. I probably was into my speech three to three and a half minutes. I would say about that long. And this really happened. The really smart guy, I have nicknamed him now. I do not remember his name, do not know his name. I call him Dr. Smarty Far. Dr. Smarty Fart really did this. He stood up in front of 2,000 people. I'm on stage speaking. Like, there's about 2,000 people here. He stood up and he yelled out loud, this guy is wasting our time. And he walked out. That is what I did too. I was like, oh, what? <laughs> oh, my word. So I, I turned, and the audience is just stunned. They, they are sitting there. Nobody's moving because they're waiting for, to see what I'm going to do. The president, he, he doesn't, he's not even looking at me. <laughs> Smarty fire is gone. And I, this is what I did. They did not know I was a preacher. You understand that, right? I'm, I'm brought in as a speaker. So, and I knew no one at that place. And so I, I started walking like this, praying. Not out loud. I was just praying. I was like, Lord. Okay, that, that's really embarrassing. <laughs> and Lord, one, the first thing I want to ask you is, can you give me like a 14-letter word? <laughs> and I want to say something amazing. <laughs> and, and, and Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift my head up, and I don't even know what to say. I remember literally going, Lord, I don't even know what to say next. And I pray that you would anoint me. And I pray, Lord, I'm, I think I'm going to preach now, Lord. I don't know. I guess they won't. Uh, the, the worst has already happened. So I'm going to go ahead and preach now. And I'm asking you to come all over me and help me know what to say and how to say it. In Jesus' name, amen. Nobody had said anything. I, I was still walking. And then I turned. And this is what I did. I turned. I looked up. And I said, for those of you who choose to remain for the next hour, uh, I'm going to attempt to talk to you about what I believe someday you will want to know and be known for. If you would like to leave, I'm going to pause another moment or two, and I'm going to let you leave as Dr. Smarty Far left. <laughs> I didn't call him that. I called whatever I said as he left. I said, if, if, if you want to... It will not bother me if you want to be dismissed at this point. I'm going to give a moment. If you'd like to leave, go for it. And I stopped. Not a soul left. And I want to tell you, I turned into a preacher. I really did. I didn't mean to. I turned, and the reason I know that is because when I finished this speech, I had people walking up to me, literally said to me, you should be a preacher. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, really? Thanks. That's awesome. And I finished the speech, and I'm, I'm giving the Lord all the glory. I, I don't need people to clap. I used to. When I was 30 and 40 and I'd speak, I needed all the applause. I, I, don't, I really don't care anymore. I, I'm here to preach the Word of God, to teach you something from God's Word. If I do that, then it was a success even if you didn't like it. And, and I want you to know, I finished speaking. I got done. And I said, thank you. Bless you. God bless you all. Thanks for letting me come. And I, I finished my speech, and I said that. And I'm, I'm not kidding you. 2,000 people 
instantaneously jumped to their... They were literally cheering. They were clapping. They were yelling. And I want, I, I'm not into all this, but I want to tell you, I know I love God and everything, but I walked off that stage like, like this. Booyah. Mm, mm, mm. I did. I, I, I'll admit I was cocky for a minute because it felt so good. <laughs> Stick it right back. And I, I walked out of there going, God, I don't know what happened there, but you just did something awesome. Those people, many who have never even heard about going to church probably, heard a sermon on what matters in life, and they instantaneously were like, that's what counts. And I remember driving home from Lansing back to my home in Holland as I was driving. I remember this thought came to my mind. There were two people that spoke on that stage today. One of them spoke with intellect and one of them spoke with wisdom and it wasn't like I was bragging about that it's just true because it doesn't take into let me read it again by intellect a house no wisdom you need right now with your circumstance in your family I need right now with my 18 year old daughter issue I need to go to God James chapter 1 verse 5 if any of you Dan Seaborn lacks wisdom let him turn to God who gives generously without finding fault today in your family in your basket I can tell you what you need wisdom from God seek it his word says for those who seek him they find him you say Dan what does that look like you know, I, I come to church. I hear you preachers up there all the time. You talk. You guys probably have a little room at your house where you go and you have dinner with God and you hang out and you chat with Him. You come up here and you preach these sermons. Well, I don't have that, Dan. Oh, I'd like to talk to you for just a second. I want to tell you where I get wisdom from God. This really is true. I go sit by Lake Michigan. My wife will sometimes say to me, when I'm not doing good, and she can tell it, and I'm stressed, even recently, she will say this phrase to me, Dan, you need to go by the lake. That's what she says. Dan, you need to go by the lake. What she means is, you need to go spend some time one-on-one -on -one with God. And she knows one of my favorite ways to do that is go drive out by Lake Michigan and sit there, looking basically straight across at Milwaukee. And you know what happens to me every time I go to the lake? I'm going to tell you. I'll sit there for an hour, hour and a half. I might read a few verses of scripture that I usually lay my Bible down on the passenger seat and I look out across the water. And I'm going to tell you what happens. I have never been sitting at, never been sitting at Lake Michigan and seen a large fish jump up in the water with a sign on his fin that says, yo, yo, God's here and he's watching you, Dan. You're awesome. I've never seen it. If I did see it, I'm going to tell you, I'd get out of my car. It would be unreal. But see, we like signs. Now, some of you, you say, Dan, oh, I've had those signs. Oh, I'm really happy for you. I'm, I celebrate that God give you a great sign. I haven't. There are seagulls out there by the beach everywhere. You would think that God, in all of his infiniteness, every now and then, would send down a seagull to land on the hood of my car and peck in Morse code, Dan, Jesus, it's here. He's with you. You're awesome. You would think, I mean, I preach all over the world for him. Can he send me one seagull? <laughs> Never has. The worst thing the seagulls do is drop that stuff right on the hood of my car. <laughs> That's the truth. I'm a realist. But can I tell you what does happen? Every time I go to the lake, let me tell you what really happens. I sit there, and I sit there to realize after a while, wow, I can't even see Milwaukee over there on that other side. But God loves the people over on that side of the lake just as much as he loves the people on this side of the lake. And he loves me over here on this side of the lake. And he actually created all the fish that are swimming between the two cities here. And he actually knows the depth of this lake in the middle. he got all this water in here. He sustains this water. He sustains life. Good grief, Dan. You are fine. Pick yourself up and go back home. Perspective perspective because everybody in this room understands that when I say sometimes life gets out of perspective your stinking issues look so big that you don't think there's any way you're going to be able to handle them and God says um, can I remind you I was here before you were born and I'll be here after you're born you're fine get up 
You know what's funny to me? All the people we get up here and preach about, all the sermons. Like if I said, today I want to talk about Daniel. We all go, oh, yeah, oh, that was a man. He was awesome. Threw him in the lion's den. Do you think when they were telling him, hey, we're going to put you in the lion's den, he was walking there going, yes, I was hoping for this. Come on. No, he was human just like us. He wasn't looking forward to being thrown in a lion's den. He was probably praying the whole way. God shut their mouths. And I want to say to you, just because God doesn't flutter down a bird and hit you in the head with it and remind you that he loves you, he does. And he will speak to you about your basket and usually it'll be by giving you peace in your circumstance and wisdom and guidance and thoughts that you go, wow, God, thanks for guiding me here. I didn't know exactly how I was going to handle this. Seek him for wisdom. I don't know your scenario today, but God... There's 2,000 of, of us just walked in this sanctuary. God knows right where you are right now. Right now. I don't. Afterwards, a few of them will come up and tell me, and then I'll know. But uh, right now, I don't know. God does. Seek Him. Because wisdom builds the house. And then after wisdom builds the house, the next part of the verse says, Wisdom builds it, and understanding establishes the home. To understand means to make strong or secure. The word understanding tied with the word establishes, I mean, I mean, um, understand establish, it means to make it strong or secure. Let me give you a picture of what that means. If I said to you today, you need to be an understanding parent, you need to get strength and security to your home, let me give you a picture of what that looks like. If this is your basket and you want to be understanding and create security, here's what you do. I got you. Because see, a lot of kids are growing up in this house. These are real eggs. A lot of kids are growing up in, no, mom and dad, stop. Can you guys stop fighting? Mom and dad, don't. Have you ever seen your own kids stand over on the side in the kitchen just looking at you like, can you guys stop? This is what it feels like. I, I can show you what kids like. I was a kid once. And my dad's 80-something now. Can, can I still tell you? I'm a kid and I still long, and now our relationship has been healed. And my dad, actually, the last time I was down to visit him, he said, come here, son, before I left, come here, son. He hugged me. I'm 50-plus years old. Do you know how good that felt? Because I finally have a dad who's given me some love and security. We're human beings. We love this. This is what God does for us. And I don't know your circumstances today, but I know that wherever you are, what you need is this right here. And God would reach down and say, I got you. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I used to listen to this guy on the radio. I, I loved his show. Partly I loved his voice, and he was a good guy to learn to speak from. And his name was Paul Harvey. He used to have a show. Many of you heard that show. He'd always end with, good day. And, and it was just a great show, and a little segment. And my son one time, Josh, that one is in Camden, New Jersey, when he was just a little boy. We were driving down the road and we were listening to Paul Harvey. And Paul Harvey said, I have a science thing I want to share with you today. And my son was listening. He's always into that science stuff. And he heard, uh, he heard Paul Harvey say, twice a year, on the first day of spring and the first day of fall, you can stand an egg up on its end and it will stay there because of the equinox and the balance of the earth and all this stuff. My son's like, Dad, do you think that's really true? I said, I have no idea, son. I never heard that before. And so all that, when Josh was a little boy, one of the first days of spring or fall, he remembered that, and he went and got an egg, and he, he stood it up on its end, and sure enough, he let it go. He's like, Dad, it really... Now, today's not the first time of spring or fall, so there she goes. It's going down. <laughs> but on that first day of spring or fall, it really will stand up right on its end. He's 23 now. He's 23. The first day of fall this past year, he's been gone from home now a few years, working over in Camden, New Jersey, and he took a picture of a of an egg the first day of fall this year. He's 23. He took a picture of an egg standing up in the kitchen where he's living and he he took a picture with an iPhone, sent it to me with a text going, Dad, it still works. (laughs) And and I want to say to you, uh, in my family, the Seaborn home, the picture you saw, it feels like about twice a year that we all stand the same direction. Maybe two days a year we all wake up and seem to be on the same page. Otherwise, one seems to be spinning or rolling most of the time. I, I don't know what your house is like, but in our house, we don't all wake up in the same mood. You know, if I, good morning, morning, Lord bless you, you too. Got some breakfast? Sure, cook me an egg. I mean, that doesn't happen in my house. You want breakfast? No, I don't want breakfast. 
If I say to my, my daughter, will be coming down the steps, good morning, Anna, you look beautiful. I do not. <laughs> well, I was just trying to compliment you. Not now. I don't feel like it. I'm like, honey, what's up with your attitude? Nothing. I'm like, do you notice you have an edge on you? No. I mean, it's, like, it's family life. I don't like it. I love the mornings. And she's coming down and says, morning, Anna, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Dad. How are you? Hang on. Let me have a faint here and pick back up and then I'll tell you. It's <laughs> wonderful when you're all on the same page about twice a year it's family life and and for a parent to go oh today oh man i I don't have a lot of energy but what i do have i'll I'll try to invest in you today oh oh you need some help too okay and that's why i go out by the lake by myself that's where i'm sustained and it's called life and some of you today are in a situation like with me that you don't want to be in. I've adopted a little phrase in my life the last six months. It's, it comes up like this. It looks like I've invented a new Wii game. I have not. This is my little thing I'm living by. It's called Iwi. That's what I say. And it stands for this. It is what it is. Iwi. I'd love to go back six months ago before my family was going through some of this stuff. But I can't. You don't get to go back. Iwi. It is what it is. When your children come to you today and say, Daddy, why is it we don't have a 60-inch color television to watch the Super Bowl on? You look at them and you go, Ewe, you're watching black and white, 12-inch, be done with it. It is what it is. <laughs> life throws stuff at you that you don't want. It's life. And listen, if you want to be an understanding parent, you got to realize that today God is looking down and says, I understand what you're dealing with, and I know that your life is what it is, but I'm here to be your God. I understand you. I got you. And then you, look, God does this for you, and then you pass it right on to your kids. Thank you, God, for holding me. I will hold those you've given me. Wisdom, understanding, and then the Bible says by knowledge... The rooms are filled. All the little rooms in your house get filled with knowledge. Notice it doesn't say from the knowledge of the parents, from the knowledge of the grandparents. It doesn't say that. That's a lot of great wisdom comes from those two sets of people. But the bottom line is knowledge can fill your basket up from everybody in the family. Sometimes a two-year-old can say something really brilliant for a home. Sometimes a five-year-old can spot something that needs to be dealt with a lot better than everybody else. And knowledge is what you gain from everyday life experiences. I remember when, when our family was a little younger, we used to do a road trip. I'd speak, you know, and I was speaking in North Carolina. We'd been gone like two weeks, and we were driving back home, and we were coming through Indianapolis, Indiana. There's a little road that goes around it. 65 goes through it. 465 goes around it. And, and oh, we had been gone from home a long time. I was driving. We had like a six-person passenger van, you know, Jane and I, my wife in the, in the front seat, and I was driving, and, and then the next seat was Alan and Josh, and Chrissy and Anna were in the very back, and, and I started thinking about our two weeks away. I'd been speaking, and then we'd visited family, and, and I'm driving, and, and, and I finally thought to myself, man, you know, Josh, he was a teenager now, and I, I, and I was like, man, you know, I got to deal with some stuff, and he had a bad attitude a couple of times on this trip. I better deal with that, and so I'm driving, and I, I kind of look back through the mirror there, I say, hey, Jay, I called him Jay, hey, Jay. He's like, yo, Dad. I said, can you take your head? Of course, he had headphones on. I was like, can you take your headphones off, man? I need to talk to you. So he picked them off, and I said, can I talk to you a minute, Josh? He said, yeah, Dad, what's up? Remember, I'm talking about knowledge in your basket. I said, well, son, um, as we were driving here, I, I just got to thinking about our trip away. You know, the other day when we were at Grandma and Grandpa's, and you copped that attitude? And I said, you know, you know how I feel about attitudes, and I'm going to correct it, and I'm going to deal with it. I said, son, can you just work on that? Because I don't like it when you act that way, and it's kind of embarrassing. And all, he said, Dad, you know what? You're right, and I'm sorry. And that was pre- it was like, whoa, what? He said, yeah, I'm sorry I came across that way. I do see what you're saying, and I will try to change that. I'm sorry. I said, hey, no problem, man. Thanks a lot. Put his headphones back on. I'm still driving. I'm going, oh, that was pretty easy. <laughs> Threw a little knowledge in the basket. That worked pretty good. And I'm driving, and all of a sudden, I see him taking his headphones off again. And a couple minutes later, I'm still driving around 465 in Indianapolis, and, 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 and I see him taking his headphones off, and, and he said, Hey, Dad. I was like, Yes, yeah, son. He said, Can I talk to you about something for a second? <laughs> and I said, Yeah. He said, um, Oh, it was, this was what was really funny. My wife was reading a book, and she looked over at me like, Hmm. <laughs> 
And I was like, um, well, Josh, what, what, what do you want to talk to me about? He said, well, Dad, you know, it's been a long trip. And do, do you remember the other day at Grandma and Grandpa's when you lost it with us? I was like, well, yeah, I, I kind of remember that. He said, well, Dad, honestly, I, I just thought you had a really bad spirit and a bad attitude. It was kind of embarrassing for us as kids, too, because Grandma and Grandpa were, like, looking at you and wondering why you were getting so frustrated. Dad, do you think there's any chance you could work on that kind of stuff? <laughs> what you going to do? Are you going to dish wisdom? In, I mean, are you going to dish knowledge into his basket and then be unwilling when he dishes it back? Because he was dead right. I knew exactly what he's talking about. Why I didn't pre-think about that before I said anything to him and cover it and get it under the rug, I don't know. But he said, Dad, I'd, I'd, just, I'd really appreciate it if you worked on that. Oh, is my wife enjoying this? She's looking at me like, ooh. I literally, I did say to him, did your mom do anything? And he went, no, I don't remember it. I went, Ugh. And she's like, you know, she's and I said, son, I will. I said, son, I'm so sorry. In fact, if everybody had phones off, I got everybody's headphones off. And I said, hey, guys, Josh just pointed out how I behaved at Grandma and Grandpa's. And you know what? When you guys act that way, I always want to correct you. And this time it's my turn to say I'm sorry. Will you guys all forgive me? And they're like, yeah, yeah, Dad, we're good. We're good. We forgive you. I said, hey, thanks a lot. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what I did the rest of the way home. Zip it, drive, and be quiet. <laughs> Get home, baby. Because you see, your children, you ready? L listen to me. Parents, I want to say this to you. Right now, your kids, they could tell you some stuff that you could work on. If you feel real confident today at your lunch table and you got the guts into you just to say it, just look at your kids and say, do you guys, is there anything I'm doing that when you get older and have your own kids, you're saying right now, I'm not going to do that when I get old. Tell me what that thing is. Because they wait, they're waiting for the opportunity. If you don't let them do it now, they'll be telling a counselor in like 10 years. So you might as well go ahead and get it out. It's life. Knowledge is what fills the basket. And the Bible says if wisdom builds the house, if understanding establishes a home, if knowledge fills it up, the result is according to God's word. This is what Proverbs 24 says. You have right here at the end a rare and beautiful. The word rare and beautiful treasure. Your basket is a thing of beauty. God gave it to you. I want to show you how important it is to love this basket and why it matters so much. We have a counseling center right across the lake. We have uh, about 10 counselors there who work with all kinds of family therapies, different things. They're clinically uh, trained and, and they're professional counselors and it's absolutely awesome. I, I'm a speaker. I'm not a counselor. And uh, one of our counselors came in my office the other day and she said, Dan, I want to show you something. And we have at our offices what we call preventative or preemptive counseling where you can come in. You don't have any problem going on in your family right now. You just want to kind of a little bit of a checkup, make sure things are fine. A little family coach that comes along beside you, kind of helps you because nobody wants to fall into a mess with their basket. So this couple came in with their little daughter. Now, HIPAA laws don't allow me to know a lot of the details about who they are or anything, but the mom gave me written permission to share this story with you, so I have written permission and would not break that confidentiality. And though I don't know them, I know it was a mom and a dad and a little girl. They came into our counseling center. The mom and dad went into the adult office, and the little girl went into the little child therapy center with our counselor, Emily. And when she got in there with her, Emily just said to the little girl, I want you to draw me a picture of what your life feels like as it relates to your family. She gives the child an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and says to her, draw me a picture of what your life feels like. And the little girl drew the picture. She's five or six years old. She drew this picture. It's a picture probably a lot of you have on your refrigerator at home. Something like it. A normal child picture. And I said to Emily, oh, that's so cool. That's awesome. She goes, oh, Dan, when a child draws a picture, you know, so the reason I have them do this is because it tells me so much about their life. I said, what do you mean? She said, oh, like, like she said, take the sun up in the left-hand corner. That sun, normally when a child draws a sun, they might put one or two rays. Look how extremely careful she was to make those little rectangular looks to the whole thing. She drew it perfect. And look at the size of the smile. That's not a, just a little line smile or a quick smile. It's huge. Dan, this little girl is happy. I was like, oh, that, that's cool. 
And she said, oh, there's so much more. I'm, what do you mean? She said, well, see that line? See that blue line across the top? And then the cloud. She said, when a child draws things in line, in a row, that means in their life at the age of five or six, things feel lined up. They're in order. Things are fine and in order. Now, I know what you're going to do. You're going to go home and you're going to say to your kid, draw a picture. Draw it right now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> Some of you wives are saying to your husband, you're going to draw one when we get home. I'm going to see if it... So she said, and look, the little girl not only drew herself, but look, she's on the top of the mountain. She said, she, she, is, she just feels like things are really good. Beautiful hair, big blonde hair, big blue eyes, uh, beautiful little pink dress. Just a touch short, but a beautiful pink dress. And she said, and then look at that big heart. Big old heart. That says, God's, in, God's right next to me, man. He's got me. He's caring for me. She said, that, this little girl is crazy happy. And I was like, Emily, thanks. I appreciate you showing me. She goes, oh, Dan, I, I didn't come to show you this picture. I came to show you the next picture. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, the same little girl came back to our offices. Two weeks later, for, we still don't know why, the dad decided, I'm done with his family. He set the basket down and he walked out. Left a single mom with one little girl. The same little girl came back. Two weeks later, Emily handed the same little girl, two weeks later, another clean eight by half, 11 sheet of paper, and the little girl drew this picture. Dark Valley and Scribble Valley. Emily said, Dan, she started trying to draw herself, and then all of a sudden she just couldn't handle it anymore, and she just started going nuts with the crayons. She said, I just sat back and let her go. And then she said, she said she drew a little family. Now it's got four people. I don't know if that represents somebody else that came in and put a little something over their heads. This pit, she said, this picture just reeks of a child whose life has gone into disarray. And she said, what's so sad for me is God's not in the picture at all to her. She said, I just sat there and watched her and cried. And I want to tell you today, Emily said to me, Dan, it might not be easy for people to see, but you need to show this picture all across the country because people need to know it's hard on a child. When my wife first saw this and her dad had walked out when she was six, she literally started crying. She said, that was me. And I tell you this story today not to discourage you, but to tell you that I don't understand what I'm about to say because I was the little boy who drew that picture too and I don't know how God did it other than his redeeming grace but he took a guy who grew up in a little home and a girl l listen to this he took Dan Seaborn who grew up in a little house that looked like that he took Jane Olerud who grew up in a house that looked like that and he turned it in Dan and Jane got married and I don't know how God's done it but we've been able to go and instead of painting this picture we've tried to paint picture number one and I'm trying to do that the best. Right now, i got a couple of clouds that aren't in a row. Today, I'll go home. I'm driving home as soon as I get done here. And I'm hoping to get there in time to watch the Super Bowl. I know my wife's thrilled about it. And I'm going to do my best to get home. And I, I may have to deal with something I don't like to deal with. But, iwi. And you may go home to an iwi situation. I'm saying to you, Go do your best with whatever you have right now in your basket to paint picture number one. Because of Jesus Christ, we can do it. He came to give us hope. He said, I came to give you life and give you life abundantly. And I'm going to try to go home and live that kind of life. I am not hanging my head. I'm not a trash can guy. I'm not going to stay in it. I'm not going to let Satan beat me up and tell me I'm a piece of nothing. Because I'm not. Because of Jesus Christ, I have hope. Because of Jesus Christ, you have hope. You may need to go sit by the lake and look at a seagull. What I want you to do is realize God is with you. He cares for you. Thank you, bro. He cares for you. He'll watch over you. And he'll go home with you. And I'm asking you today to leave here with hope in Jesus. For your basket, I'm done with the family feud. The series is over. It's time to present hope in this world for Jesus Christ. Lord God, thank you for my Elbrook friends. Right across the lake, friends. We didn't know each other before today, but I pray we have a unison in our hearts to go and love the Lord Jesus Christ with all we got. And help us with some of these baskets that have rattled around in our hands. Help us to keep grip on it and be faithful so that someday... When life's all over, we'll be able to say we were faithful to God with what we've been given, a rare and beautiful treasure. Thank you for this privilege to be reminded what worked for you creating the universe will work for us building a home. And we love you. In Jesus' name we all say, amen.